Welcome everyone to um, the second of our COBOL Fridays webinar series. Um, we launched this last week with the launch of the brand new COBOL course that is now available on the Open Mainframe project. <clears throat> I'd like to welcome today um, McKinsey Mana, who is going to be walking us through um, how to get you know, the installation done with the environment, get access to the system that we've been talking about in the COBOL labs and actually run a COBOL program. So McKinsey is going to walk us through that. Um, McKinsey is a um, computer science software development master's student at Marist College, all set to graduate this May. Yay, congratulations, McKinsey. Um, so Thank she you. is, she just joined IBM in the IBM Red Books team um, as a project leader. Uh, interesting fact or a tidbit about McKinsey, she loves dabbling in various programming languages. So I have a very um, fun question for McKinsey, um, given that she's now added COBOL to her feather, uh, um, to, a, to her feathers in her cap, um, as to what her before thought about COBOL was and what she thinks about COBOL after her experience in creating and being part of the team that created this content. So stick around, we will talk about um, we will hear from McKinsey on that and more after um, she walks us through how do you run a COBOL program. So take it away, McKinsey. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sadarshna. So today I'm going to walk you through, just like Sadarshna said, setting up the connection to the ZOS mainframe. And then we're gonna go through two different COBOL programs um, first and foremost, if you're following along at home, you need to have downloaded and installed the prerequisites. So that is Node.js, Java SDK, Visual Studio Code, and Zoe Explorer and IBM Z Open Editor extensions for Visual Studio Code. So when you open Visual Studio Code, it's going to look something like this. And if you're not sure if you have the extensions installed, you can go right over here to the left side toolbar and you can click this extensions icon. And that's going to show you which extensions you have enabled. And if you're missing one, you can just search it right here. And you'll have a screen that pops up like this when you find it and it will say install right here. So if you don't have that, you can go ahead and do that right now. It's very quick. So next, I'm going to open up the Zoe Explorer right down here, this Z in the diamond. And you'll see we get these three sections. Data sets, Unix system services, and then jobs. We're going to start at data sets and we're going to create our profile that's going to establish the connection to ZOS. So you can go ahead and expand data sets. You'll notice that I have these favorites folders. I have them in each section. You may not have that. It's because I've created connections in the past. However, if you don't have it, it should pop up after you create your first connection. If not, it's okay. It's not important to what we're gonna be doing today. So to create the profile, you'll see once you expanded this data set section, you have these two symbols that pop up. You're going to want to click the plus sign to add a profile. And be careful here, it's a little misleading. It looks like you're supposed to type it in, but you don't want to do that. You want to actually click create a new connection to ZOS. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to click that. And then it's going to prompt you for a connection name. So I'm going to name mine Learn COBOL. You can name yours whatever you want. And then just hit enter. And next, you're going to be prompted for the ZOSMF URL that's going to establish the connection to ZOS. And this information was in the registration email that you received after you set up an account with the Open Mainframe project. So I would suggest just copying and pasting it so that um, you don't have any errors. So go ahead and hit enter after you type that URL in. 
And then it's going to ask you for your username, which was also contained in that email. So I'm going to go ahead and type mine in, and you can go ahead and type yours in. And I'm going to hit enter. And then again, the password was also in that email that you received. So type that in and hit enter. Be careful here not to just continuously press enter because the default selection is not what we want. We want to click false. We want to accept connections with self-signed certificates. So I'm gonna go ahead and click false. And you'll see, I have my profile right here. Profile Learn COBOL was created. So now that I have this connection set up, I need to, I need to filter out the data sets that are allocated to my specific ID and you will be doing it for your specific ID. So in order to do that, I'm gonna expand the Learn COBOL folder and I'm gonna hit this search icon right here. And you'll see I have a list here of filters that I've already used. That's because, like I said, I've created previous connections, but I'm just going to pretend that those don't exist down there and I'm gonna do it as you would. And I'm gonna type in my ID and hit enter. And you give it a second. And you'll see a list of the data sets beginning with my ID have appeared here. So now that we've set up that connection, we're all set and ready to start on a program. But before I start with that, I just want to stop here and see if there are any questions that anybody had about the uh, setting up a connection process. Um, we're good for now, McKinsey. I think we can continue, okay. yeah. Great. So, the two folders that we're going to be paying attention to is going to be this id.cbl folder, which contains all of the source code for all of the COBOL programs in the course. And then we have this id.jcl folder, which contains all the JCL code for each program in the course. So first I wanna look at the program that we're gonna run. So that's gonna be the Payroll 00 program. We can click that and it's gonna open up. And I just wanna go through the contents of this program so we can kind of understand what it's supposed to produce as an output. And then we can go ahead and, and submit that job and view that output. So firstly, I want to talk about these seemingly random vertical lines throughout the program. So they're not, ac they're actually not random at all. They represent the differentiation of areas in COBOL. And these areas are really important because COBOL is a structured programming language and it must be written in reference format and reference format consists of these different areas. So each of these vertical lines represent the beginning and ending column of each area. So this would be a column or an area, I'm sorry, and this and whatnot. Each area has specific rules that govern the content that can be written within that area. And if you're interested in learning more about that, you can ask questions at the end or you can go right to the course book and check out chapter four. So next, I wanna talk about the different divisions that the program is split up into. You can see right here, we have identification division, data division, and procedure division. Starting at identification division, this division contains the basic program identification information, like the name of the program, which you can see right here. It could also contain information like the author and stuff of that sort. The next section, the next division that we have, excuse me, is the data division. And the data division is where we define the data type of the data names used within the program. So you'll see we have these data names right here and then these data types right here that we've defined for each of them. The data name definitions have to be placed within a data division section. And the one present here is the working storage section you'll see right here. The, these different data division sections represent different characteristics of the data and storage for the program. So looking at the data types assigned to th these data names 
specifically in this program. The PIC X here represents an alphanumeric data type, whereas the PIC 9 represents a numeric data type. And then the numbers you see within these parentheses, those represent the length of that data name value. So next we have the procedure division. The procedure division contains the instructions for what the program should execute. It's where all of the work gets done in the program and it tells the program what to do with all of the information that we've previously defined. You can see here there's some move statements where it's taking strings and numbers and placing them into the data names that we have defined. And then we have a calculation statement right here using compute. And then we have some display statements. So this is what should what the output should contain. There is another division that's not present in this program, but is worth mentioning, and that's the environment division. And it's not present here because it's only required if the program will be reading from or writing to external data sources, which we're not doing here. So it's not required. So now that we've gone through that program and we sort of understand exactly what it's supposed to be doing, let's take a look at the corresponding JCL file. So I'm gonna close up the .cbl folder and I'm gonna expand my .jcl. So these JCL files, they contain the JCL code to run, to compile and execute the program, to run the program. So it, these are also the files that you would click to submit the job. You wanna be careful not to accidentally submit the source code. It's not gonna produce any results for you. And I'll show you what that error message looks like really quickly. So if I go into my source code and I go to the program that I want to run and I right click it and I hit submit job, I'm gonna get this REST API failure right here. So if you are trying to submit a job and you get this kind of an error message, it's likely that you just accidentally submitted the source code instead of the JCL code. So we don't want that. So I'm gonna close that back up and I'm gonna go back to my JCL file and I'm going to right click and I'm going to submit the job. And you'll see down here in the bottom right, job submitted, job number 1714. Okay, so the job was submitted, but what now? There's no, there's no new files here. How do we know that it worked? How do we see the output? Where is everything? So we're actually gonna close up the data sets because we're done with that for now. And we're gonna expand the job section. And here we need to add the profile that holds the connection. So we're going to click add profile. And this time you'll notice that your connection is right here listed. So you can go ahead and click that. And now you'll see that folder present. And that folder contains all of the jobs associated with that connection. So the first thing I wanna take note of is the CC0000 right next to the job. And that represents the condition code of the job. And that means that the condition of the job that ran, so all zeros is a successful job run and anything higher than that means that there was some sort of problem. So to view the output, we're gonna expand our job folder. We've got all these fun things in here. What we're gonna look at first is we're gonna look at the compiler output, this sysprint 101. So I'm gonna click that. And this is going to show if, if there were um, errors when the code was compiling, this is where we would know uh, what those errors are. This is where we would see that. It would have a message because we didn't have an error. We can see that with the zeros, there won't be one, but you can scroll down and see that the source code is in this compiler output. And if you go all the way to the bottom, you'll see return code of zero, which is just another confirmation that yes, the program was compiled and executed. And then to view the output, we're gonna go ahead and click payroll sys out. That is the execution output. 
And as you can see, it the program did exactly what we thought it would. And that is to show us the name of the, I guess, worker and then all of his payroll information. So now that we've gone through that, I want to take a minute and see if there are any questions on that. Are we good, Siddarshna? Okay. Um, no, I think you try the next lab. Okay, sounds good. All right, so now that we've gone through what a successful job run will look like, I just want to take you through what an unsuccessful job run would look like. So we can close up our jobs folder and go back to our data sets. And this time what we're going to do is we're going to submit the job for payroll 0x. So I'm going to right click that and I'm going to submit job and I'll get my confirmation down here, job submitted, 1718, okay. And then like I did previously, I'm gonna close that up just to avoid clutter on my screen. I'm gonna open up the jobs, open up my profile and there is my second job right there, the payroll 0x job 1718. The first thing that you can notice here is the condition code. It's not four zeros. So that means that we have some sort of error. So let's figure out what that error was and how we can change it, how we can fix it. Another thing you can notice here once you open it up is there's no um, sys out. There's no execution output. So that's just yet another indicator that something went wrong. So I'm gonna look at the compiler output. And what I'm gonna be looking for here is the IGY message. So I'm gonna scroll down until I find that. So here it is right here on line 107. And it's pointing us to line 21 in the source code, which is right above it. And it's telling us that that's where the error occurred. And what exactly was that error? Well. Right here, it tells us. It's telling us that the data name definition we gave gross pay cannot be used in this compute statement. So we gave it an alphanumeric data type right here and written right here in the source code. However, the compute statement needs it to be numeric or numeric edited. So we need to go back into the source code and we need to change this so that it reflects a numeric data type. So I'm gonna go back into my data sets and I'm gonna open up my source code, source code folder. I'm gonna open up my source code and I'm gonna find that line right here. And like we discussed previously in going over the first lab, we said the X represents alphanumeric, so we wanna change that to a nine to represent numeric. And you'll see the data set automatically saves, which is nice, so you don't have to worry about, you know, file and saving that. And now to, to just verify that that was the proper correction we needed to make, let's resubmit the job and make sure that we get the output that we are expecting. So I'm going to go back into my JCL files and I'm going to run that corresponding JCL file again. I'm going to submit it. Job submitted 1722. And then uh, you can notice here it's not it hasn't shown up yet. So if that's the case and you didn't close this up, you can just hit the refresh right here and that'll pull in your most recent job. So you can see job 1721, it's a 22, excuse me, it's the third one on the list. And we got a condition code of all zeros. So that's great, that means it worked. That means that we fixed the error. And furthermore, we can go to see the execution output and see that it's exactly what we expected to happen. So that is what I have for you today. And now we're gonna turn to questions.
Thank you, Mackenzie. Um, we have a quiet audience for now, but as we start to get other questions in the chat, let me um, come back to the question um, that I was thinking about earlier. You've you worked with many programming languages as a computer science student yourself, and um, this is one of your first projects. And right off the bat, you got to work with COBOL. So when you were first told, hey, you're going to work on this COBOL project, what came to mind or what were you thinking when you researched what really COBOL is coming into this? And now that you've worked through this process and learned COBOL, um, what, what do you think of the programming language? So just your before and after thoughts. I'm very curious. Sure. So before this project, um, I had no idea what COBOL was. I had never heard of it. I didn't even know that it was a programming language, um, which I think is fair because there are a lot of programming languages out there. It's hard to know all of them, but it's interesting that that it has never been brought up given it's, um, it's everywhere. So, so yeah, so I didn't, I didn't know anything about it. So just upon like a quick Google search, I figured out that it was a programming language for enterprise systems and, um, it looked intimidating. Um, there's a lot of negative, uh, annotation about it, which now post course, I completely disagree with. Um, but just seeing that right off the bat is, you know, it's a little off putting. So I was nervous, um, but excited because it is everywhere and it's important. So after this project and after producing the course and, and going through the material and, and working the labs and everything, um, I found that it is much less intimidating than you would think. Um, it's very, it's very straightforward in my opinion. The the language, as you can see, um, is is very English like. So for me, that that makes it easier to read, and also just the structure of the programs and how strictly you need to adhere to that structure. I think is extremely helpful to anybody learning the language because there's no guessing on where to put things. There is a specific place where they need to go and in a specific order, and you can find that out with a quick Google search or by just taking this course, which is how I learned it. So, so yeah, so the, the structure and the simplicity of the vocabulary um, for the language is is really great, and I also think that that structure helps with avoiding things like spaghetti code. Um, you can get really lost in logic sometimes when when trying to le read uh, different languages, and I I feel like COBOL kind of eliminates that for the most part just due to its format. But I think that this course was a uh, a phenomenal foundation to really spike interest in the language and to take everything that you learn in the course and you know try to apply it to some real world scenarios that you yourself have experienced and you know just taking it and and trying to play with it a little bit i think that the course provided um a really really great foundation for that we have a question from the in the Q and A from Scott um, Mackenzie. How did you get the file to automatically save? Uh, the defaults in his VS Code aren't, aren't set that way. Oh, um, I did not change any settings. So this was that is how it worked for me from the installation and opening from the get-go so i am not sure how you would change that okay so um there is a setting you can use in the preferences of vs code called auto save so if you go into preferences oh right there there we go 
Yeah. Oh, auto save is turned on. Um, excellent. So there you go. That's your answer. Um, <laughs> if that isn't set on or you can't see that, because um, I think um, I think you're on Windows, aren't you, Mackenzie? I am. So in Windows, um, I don't think auto save um, appears there. So if it doesn't, you can go into preferences and settings and you'll find it in there. There you go. Auto save delay. There you go. Ah, great. And Scott said that's worked. Thanks. So we've we've helped. Excellent. So. <clears throat> Another thing that, that I found interesting um, was, I, I guess I'm a little confused as to why uh, COBOL is not even mentioned in any course curriculum that I've taken with regard to computer science. I've, I found that very interesting and puzzling. Uh, because it's not, it, it's a skill that we see right now that is in demand. It's not definitely not going anywhere anytime soon. So it's interesting to me that it's not, the concept of, of COBOL is not even rushed upon, at least in my experience. So that's a very interesting point. I, um, I had a chance to chat to a lecturer in a university in the UK who's just started doing a Kix COBOL um, piece of education. And she was saying that the reason that they don't necessarily mention it um, is that from a advertising perspective, sometimes it doesn't sound as cool or as relevant as um, le learning something like Node.js or something like that. When um, we all know in reality, you know, learning COBOL is going to be a great language for you to pick up. You're going to get many great skills from doing so, and it could be a really valuable part of your career. Um, but it, what's interesting is that the students on that course, once they've started, really enjoy COBOL, really enjoy working on the mainframe, and it's great. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think it may be a, it doesn't sound quite as cool to someone who's new to the industry as writing in more modern or newer languages. Mm -hmm. That makes sense, I guess. All about perspective, right? <laughs> Yep. Um, okay, so um, maybe one of our panelists could chime in here a little bit as well. Um, what is JCL code for someone who doesn't know? Um, Will, do you want to take that? Yeah, so I I, I struggled with the Q&A to reply. Um, I, I think the, the, the person that answered, asked the question actually knew, but was just um, kind of hoping that it would get perhaps shared for um, someone in the audience that may not know. So yes. JCL stands for Job Control Language, and it's a language that is used to run tasks or jobs on ZOS. So um, every time you want to run a, a, a program um, on the mainframe, you will have a piece of JCL or Job Control Language that will do it, um, or, or you will write and then submit to run that program. So it, it can be thought of a little bit like um, bash scripting for the mainframe. Thank you, Will. Quickly glancing through if we have any other questions on chat or Q&A. Okay. Yeah, so um, we don't, we do not have any other questions right now. Um, but if our panelists have any, um, you know, comments to on the um, content or VS Code or anything specific. In the meantime, I another question came up in my mind, McKinsey. Um, have you? Um, are there any um, typical pitfalls, if you will, when trying to get this whole environment set up? that you might have experienced as well that you may want to share with our audience as things that you want to avoid or keep in mind type of quick tips that would come to mind? Um, I think that the the biggest thing is is to really like read and follow the instructions that we provided in the book because um, it is easy to just, you know, try to 
go through it super fast and, and accidentally click something that maybe you did not mean to. And um, and actually, if if you start your creating a profile and a connection and for some reason you type the password in wrong or you need to get rid of that, um, get rid of that profile, you can do so by going into your file explorer and going to your C drive. And then from your C drive, you want to go to users and then your you user, your user. So mine is Mackenzie Mana and then Zoe and then profiles and then delete it. And once you delete it from that folder, close out Visual Studio Code and reopen it. And uh, you'll be able to start from now. And that um, that process to do so is is I believe open in a um, in a thread on on the GitHub page for the Open Mainframe project for this course. Awesome, thank you. Real quick. I I'll make a comment about JCL for those that this is their first exposure to JCL, this job control language that Will was referring to. Uh, it goes back to when the mainframe was built from the ground up over 50 years ago for business and for data. And what they had to do, because this type of technology did not exist back then, they had to achieve what was called IO device independence. And there's a lot to that architecture. And JCL, this job control language, was a way to achieve that, to separate the logical file from the physical data source. And that's what it's really all about, is connecting an internal file name to a physical data source. And the guy that came up with it, Fred Brooks, talks about it being the worst language ever, because the issue was they never saw it as a language. It's just a few control statements. And so it's a very clever mechanism for redirecting things. And so it takes a little bit of getting used to, but it's not as complex as people make it out to be. And so I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Um, another another thing too that um, that I really appreciated with this course is the essence of using Visual Studio Code to access the mainframe because when you when you Google um, COBOL, you get all these images of the ISPF editor and the 3270 emulator. And for me personally, I do not enjoy working on that. Um, I think that it's it's it doesn't come natural. Um, I don't want to control the screen using my function keys. I want to just do it normal. So using Visual Studio Code allows you to do that in, in a way where I think a lot of young developers are used to. Yeah, that's that's an excellent point you make, McKinsey. And that was one of our um, focus points in con you know creating this course, right? To bring you tooling and make it um, young developer friendly. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so I think we're good for, in terms of questions. Um, thank we you. I just had another question about the profile for the ZOSMF okay. connection. Mm -hmm. um, Mackenzie touched on it a little bit, um, but um, I've been chatting with um, someone in the chat um, to go in and into a little bit more detail. Um, if you do need to change your connection profile details, there is a folder in your home directory, which will uh, differ depending on the operating system you're running on. Uh, it's a .zoe folder. In there, you will find a zosmf uh, subfolder, and in there, you will find a YAML file um, named after the, the name of the profile that you have created. You can go in there, you can change the contents of that YAML file. And then if you just bounce uh, VS code, you will pick up those changes. Um, I think uh, Mackenzie covered most of those points, but just to reiterate them. 
Uh, we have had another question from Nancy Brown saying, is this a weekly session? Yes, it is. It's going to be a Friday weekly webinar. Um, we'll put some info out soon about what's going to come up next Friday. Yeah. Um, and Will, thank you for addressing that. And I just wanted to also point out that came up on the COBOL course Slack channel as well. And I know Paul has um, given that whole path and the instructions on how you delete your profile and get set up again. So for those who couldn't catch, you know, um, what McKinsey and Will just said in terms of the whole path you would need to take, the Slack channel is a good resource as well. And this is Paul. I did talk to the Zoe Explorer extension team about why is it that this is so hard to find? And they said that they're going to try to do something about that. We shouldn't have, it shouldn't be tribal knowledge to go to dot Zoe, then go into the, um, uh, you got to find the dot Zoe in your home, then you got to go to profile ZOSMF and then look for your connection name. And so they're going to do, they're going to try to make that a little bit more transparent or a little bit more, um, uh, mm -hmm. A little bit more help to us. I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Good to know, Paul. Thank you. They're also investigating. Um, McKinsey mentioned something early, how you have to click on the plus first before you start typing in the field for the connection name, because in many cases, some people get that profile. Something goes wrong with that profile. And I mentioned that to the development team, and they were trying to recreate the problem. And uh, all I could tell them is, well, once I knew how to do it, I can't recreate it. But boy, I could create it when I had never done it before. All right. I think that's um, that's all the questions we had for today, um, McKinsey. Thank you so much for walking us through how you get the connection set up, how to, um, I, I really enjoyed how you actually walked through the code itself a little bit and talked about um, the program before you um, gave it a run and see how it executes. That was great. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. A special thanks. Yeah. Um, special thanks to our student, global student hub team, Rafael and team for helping us with setting this weekly webinar series up. Um, and thank you um, to our IBM developer team, um, our partners who are helping us stream this um, webinar series out on the developer YouTube channel live as well. Thank you, Scott and team. And um, Rafael, I think we're good to call it a wrap. Any comments? Yeah, I think a last comment, uh, Sudarshana. Uh, McKinsey, if you can share your screen um, so we can point people to the student hub. Uh, as we said, um, this COBOL Fridays is part of uh, our uh, broader uh, student uh, strategy during the, the COVID-19 crisis. And if, if you scroll down a little bit, uh, McKenzie, uh, you can see everything that we're doing to help our students or young professionals learn about the IBM Z technology, the COBOL. So, for for the upcoming sessions, please refer to this page um, so you get all the updates. And if you have any other questions, we have a forum here that you can use that we monitor constant constantly, and we'll be glad to to help out and 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 take care of any questions that you may have. Um, all the replays, including uh, our past sessions, and this one are also there, as you can see. There's a list of replays of all the sessions that we did. So if you want to check out this, uh, this replay, the link will be available shortly on the Global Student Hub. Uh, final message, the, the, the link to this page, uh, we have a short URL, is ibm.biz, B-I-Z, ibm.biz, slash student hub altogether, okay? Um, and with that, um, thank you guys for for contributing to this uh, global initiative. It's great to have uh, this content. Uh, I know there's been a lot of interest, and I look forward to our next Cobol Friday. Thank you.
Thank yeah. you guys so much for joining. Thank you guys for uh, for the awesome speech, Mackenzie. Great job, and Thank you. look forward to see you uh, some more. Yes. With that. Thank you guys and take care. See you mm -hmm. next time.